Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of What a Concept, a new show here on Notes Reviews, where I have a new guest coming in to talk about a concept record, what makes it great, uh, and why we love them. And of course, I couldn't have think I couldn't have thought of a better person to join me on this inaugural flight than, of course, Gray Hayhurst. Uh, Hayhurst, how's it going, Grace? Long time no see. Yeah, it's going. It is certainly going. I am. Uh, busier than ever, but always eager to talk about concept albums. So there you go. Here I am. There you are. And congratulations on your new studio. It's looking amazing. Yeah, this is like maybe the first thing I've actually worked on in the, in this control room properly. So uh, yeah, still getting settled in, but uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, let's let's like picture like the uh, the champagne bottle just smashing over it, just to send it on its way, because that's what we do when we send ships out into the bay, right? right no, no no drinks on the console oh no, man okay. No, okay okay no liquids in this room <laughs> too much anxiety that's fair well we are talking about a little bit of a liquid and that is like the blood of jesus on today's episode I'm trying to find segments and that was a waste. reach but yeah okay let's go with it <laughs> this, this whole thing is just going to be a reach right because this is the first episode i don't know what the tone is going to be and i'm liking the tone that we've got right now so um because you were the one that chose this record, why don't you uh, introduce it? Why did you pick the album that you picked? What is it? What are we talking about today? So, as presumably people have seen from the title, we are talking about Testimony 1, because there is a second one, uh, by Neil Morse. And the reason why I've chosen this album um, is I'm very familiar with it. And the reason for that is... Last year, um, the Neil Morse band performed Testimony 1 and Testimony 2 in full with full band for Morse Fest in the States. And then they brought it to Europe for the first time ever. And I got a ticket and it was very exciting and I had a lot of fun. Um, and I wasn't really familiar with the record before that, but I, I have lived and breathed it for that show. And then three months later, they did it again in the UK. Um, so I actually wrote an article about that for Sonic Perspectives. So I went along a second time. Um, as Neil says, I think let's do it all again, do it all over again. One mm -hmm. of the lyrics, and uh, so I saw it twice, and I've lived with it. Um, and I also got a car a few months ago. Does the car have Bluetooth audio? No. Does it have a six CD changer in the boot? Yes. So basically, since I've got the car, it has had the CDs for Testimony One and Testimony Two. In it. <laughs> so I have listened to this record so much for the last like six to eight months. And um, I think it's incredible. I, mm. I really think out of all the concept albums out there, it's not too difficult to work out what it's about, what's going on. You know, it's not very abstract. It's not sci-fi. It's, it's not fiction, right? It is a very intimate work of music, I think, about someone's journey with themselves and finding sort of catharsis and direction in their life. Um, mm -hmm. And it just so happens to be that the story is about Neil Morse um, basically coming to really appreciate Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's really fascinating and very, very personal. Um, and it's also got a book that goes with it, the Testimony Autobiography, which you can yeah. buy online. There's an audio book as well. Um, and that's like an incredible counterpiece to this work, I think as well, because it, it fills in so many of the gaps and you understand way more what all the little kind of bits of the lyrics mean, what this kind of story is, the text of Neil's upbringing, you know, his sort of like, I don't know, crazy era in the 80s where he was just like <laughs> all over the place. Um, and we'll get into that. And um, yeah, it's just a really interesting album, I think. Um, and really interesting concept. So there you go. That's why we're here. Amazing. Yeah. And I got to I got to be full transparent on this one i never really listened to this one before you had mentioned it to me um now one of the first uh live records that i got from neil morse was his testimony to live so i like i heard bits and yeah. pieces of it and i think a part of it that just kind of like kept me at arm's length was because of how much christianity there is on this and like that never through me for any of the past concept records that he did that delved with his Christianity, like the whirlwind with transatlantic snow with Spock's beard, um, half of the stuff that he does in his own solo stuff. So I don't know why that kept me away from this. Maybe it was just because it was so like full frontal. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's in your face, right? 
Um, and I feel like compared to some other records he's done where it's kind of, you know, still concept albums, but stories from the Bible, right? It's almost a bit more mm -hmm. abstracted where it's kind of like, oh yeah, this is from the book. And if you're not necessarily a religious person, um, you can kind of, you know, take your head out of the religious side from it and just sort of like, oh yeah, okay, this is a an album about a story. Whereas obviously this is like, this is about, you know, a real person um, is about yeah. Morse. Yeah, it's, um, it's and his. it's about their beliefs. So yeah, it's yeah. it's like, I think if you are, you know, it can be a struggle to empathize. I think with it if you aren't mm -hmm. religious necessarily. That's not been the case with me. Um, I'm not a mm -hmm. religious person particularly, but um, I've really found like being able to connect with the record, like really bizarrely, just because of how sort of touching and personal it is, and how it it's just about him kind of finding his path in life like working mm -hmm. out himself who he is what his goals are what he wants to do um and you know that that is worship so there you go mm -hmm. and what i find very interesting about this and after because i'm subscribed to waterfall the streaming site that neil has the audiobook is free in there you can just go in and listen to it so that's what i ended up doing for the audiobook like the fact that this came right off of the heels of him leaving spock's beard like that that was one of the things that like i i there's a part of me it's like he left spock's beard for this uh even though in the book it yeah, kind of goes like really <laughs> <laughs> well it, it didn't ever get it didn't really get to that point but there was a part of that part of me that's just like well i don't know if like because it's another double disc concept record very similar to snow and do do I want to listen to that? Um, I mean, I should have. I really should have. But like the fact that this was his first big album after he left Spoxbeard, you know, his big like I'm I'm writing the music that I couldn't write in Spoxbeard, and this is what God is telling me. And that was one thing that I already knew about Neil's life was like he would always pray about what his next endeavor was like what is the next thing that I need to do where yeah. is the light that you're showing to me you know what's the next footpath yeah and it was very I mean clear that this was it yeah I mean as someone from the UK um that kind of like very like almost like aggressive belief um mm -hmm. in Christianity mm -hmm. like that yeah. that level of faith is yeah super super uncommon you know I went to Christian schools yeah. growing up um which is pretty common in the UK um and you know sung those hymns and that kind of stuff but i've never interacted with a man that's like yeah as just you know he had so much love for for god and jesus and uh yeah, yeah he he you know even at um more Fest europe he said the reason he was doing it was because the lord told him to right uh -huh. that god told him that you know he should bring it over to europe and do this and same with the uk shows it, it sort of like came to him in a dream and that was why he made that decision um and yeah the interesting thing about the the autobiography as well is that it mentions why he left spock's beard way more in detail i think than yeah. is kind of surfaced in like the news or like what happened at the time what was going on and i found that very very interesting is that uh -huh. b before he left he kind of moved to nashville away from la so he grew up in la yeah and uh yeah he moved away to nashville and kind of became more attached to the church over there um mm -hmm. and he's flying back and forth to to write the record with Spock and he just sort of got to a point where he was like no I have to like go my own way and do my own thing and, and just write my own music rather than you know do stuff in Spock and the the thing I I found so heartwarming and lovely in that book is that it mentions that everyone in Spock's beard was like Neil, that's fine. Cool, yeah. great. Let's we can work it into music. You can, you can, you know, lead people in prayer and shows. You can, you can praise God. You can yeah, worship. Yeah, the the line Spock's that beard. I thought was was really interesting is like, we'll have like a whole gospel choir. We can actually lead people in prayer if that's what you want to see in the music. And yeah. I'm just like, like, whoa, like like a prog band in the late '90s doing something like that. I was that's. Holy, like I could, I can understand like Creed doing that because they're a Christian band, but like a prog band in the nineties, that's heartwarming to know like, Hey, this is what we'll do for you guys. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really nice to know that the rest of the people in the band were, you know, no one was, I mean, people are upset according to how it's written. I mean, obviously this is Neil's perspective, 
in the book yeah. but um everyone was kind of upset but they were all kind of like no it's like it's okay man like you know you found yeah. something yeah. and and you've got to you've got to run with it yeah when i was getting into anyway. spock's beard and neil morris i i always thought that this was neil following peter gabriel's footprints like hey i just put out my big storytelling double disc now i'm going to be a solo artist right like following up one of our best prog records with a double disc concept record i'm going to break off after the book uh, after that it's it's what peter gabriel did before me and it's what i want to do now like the thing within the book that i thought was so interesting was like he almost fought against that impulse like whatever god was telling him like hey you should break away from spock's beard to do your own thing and he like really resisted that for the longest time mm-hmm. like it took months before he actually accepted it and been like well this is your will and i i said i'm giving my will over to you so you've got a plan yeah, for me let's yeah. follow it i mean it you know it sounds like one of the hardest decisions he kind of ever had to make right in his mm-hmm. in his in his life how it's how it's kind of framed in that book um i mean yeah. he's been through a lot <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah um like yeah, there's stuff that is covered in the second album, Testimony 2, mm-hmm. um, that I think is like, yeah, even more emotional in, in a lot of ways. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, Testimony 1. So the, the, I guess the kind of background of Neil is like, yeah. when, you know, he, he grew up in LA, very sort of like liberal, kind of arty kind of family, yeah. right? Just very chill. Um, and I love the... Um, the message you sent me when you were listening to the book and uh you were like <laughs> and it was just like hitchhiked to was that arizona or texas something and like that it was he, either he was from like, texas to arizona or from arizona to texas it was like one or the yeah. other where he was with his dad and, and his then brothers like and just like he eventually that's it. Hitchhiked like all the way back to california like yeah. over the course of like weeks and it's just like what <laughs> like in the modern it era. was the 70s but holy like, gee yeah. you're like it's crazy and how old was he like 13 he was 12 um, 12 oh my god yeah. i mean yes nuts absolutely nuts yes, um absolutely nuts and he was always yeah. a bit of a deviant you know he was a bit cheeky he was a bit mischievous mm-hmm. and then um, as he started to sort of you know mature and you know go through puberty and come into you know adulthood none of that really changed you know he yeah. knew that he didn't want to do anything but music at all mm-hmm. that was his his divine you know sort of joy in life was was music and even though there was some christianity around him it wasn't you know he wasn't really acting on it at that point in his life and that's kind of where the record starts right um in the land of beginning again and you know he, he starts off the lyrics i wish there was a way to start again mm-hmm. just blinking counts turn in the land of beginning again presumably he's wanting to sort of go back right and skip that part of his life and kind of you know i think it was a journey for him and he learned a lot but Uh i think he he possibly wishes that he'd spent more of his life with god you know and i think that's kind of what i take away from that kind of intro um yeah because yeah the records split up into five parts which Uh isn't obvious um i think you have to to know that follow it you know and that was something that like I found as a little bit of a challenge because like it really does move from piece to piece to piece but like all within these five and like the first the first one's like 40 minutes long the second one's like a half hour so like they're very it's very interesting how he chose to divide these pieces and a lot of it does reflect his journey with God and his journey so it, it makes sense that like the first part would be so long because it really takes its time to say hey this is where i came from this is everything that was leading me to rediscovering god and you know one of the yeah, things that yeah. i found I he's, there he's telling his testimony right? essentially yeah the one part in the book that's you know flavored a little bit within the album itself was like for the longest time it wasn't so much that he was like suicidal but he would be like oh i wish that this was the plane that you know led me to my doom like this is the car ride where I just drive off the road and like he wasn't living he was just kind of surviving and you know that was felt within that first half where it's like when he didn't have that relationship with God when he didn't have that he didn't feel like there was a reason to continue like that there wasn't anything there and that's part of what drove him into the more spiritual side of things it's like oh 
one day he woke up after submitting himself to God and realized that he hadn't had that thought in like a couple of years. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, that's kind of like the track California nights kind of explores that. Um, Mm -hmm, and I've got mm -hmm. like, I've got a highlight of lyrics in front of me if I keep looking down because I'm, I know the album pretty well, but not quite that well. (laughs) Yeah. So he says, yeah, if I played that terrible Eagle song one more time, I thought I was going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like there's nothing worse than the late days, but those California nights, they barely kept me alive. I think mm-hmm. because he was potentially using and driving drunk during the day yeah. and then during the night going out and doing a gig and then driving home drunk. And yeah, he kind of, the conclusion of that song is like, he believes, I believe God's grace kept me alive. Yeah. Not me, Grace. And... God's grace. <laughs> I mean, it could have been like that, your spirit there. It was just like, I need to see this guy. <laughs> through and through um Um, but yeah like what was very moving within that piece and even that section of the the testimony book was where he was saying you know i would pour my heart out with all these songs that i had personally written you know that resonated with me that came from a very deep and longing place but like i would get stares from the audience like i would get nothing and then i would just play like a led zeppelin track or a eagles like um hotel california and then people just start like raving and loving it it's like I just poured my heart yeah. and soul out and I got nothing. And yet I play a song that you can hear on the radio and you're freaking loving it. What am I doing? Like, the the amount of bands that Neil tried to put together is oh yeah. crazy. And yeah. the fact that like most of them had Alan Morse in them as well, which I think is, yeah. you know, that's very sweet. Um, yeah. But he was trying, right, to for years mm-hmm. and years and years, all sorts of different styles of, of writing, oh, yeah. trying to get something yeah. out. And I, I kind of wonder what happened to a lot of those records and and stuff that he did because I've I've not tried yeah. to look for them personally, but I do wonder if they're still around or I'm like sure. in what capacity they're around. I'm sure some of them must be around or at least wound up on some of his demo albums that he would like to put out every once in a while. The one right. I want to yeah, track yeah. down, the one I want to track down is his country and western one that he did. <laughs> um, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. If- it came through in the printed book, but in the audio book, he actually plays like about a minute and a half, two minutes of one of his country and Western songs. Oh, wow. Oh, Grace, it's bad. Oh, it's it's real bad. It's real bad. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh buddy. Oh, I can feel your love and passion into this, but a, a country Western singer, you are not. This is, I'm well, glad you found Prague because this, this is not good. Yeah. It's real bad. Yeah, I think there's a track called Sleeping Jesus, which I think yeah. is kind of the idea that you know, the Lord is always there. I mean, you, you kind of get the picture, right? And then it kind of yeah. zhuzhes into, into the second part, which is kind of, I guess, his late late 20s, early 30s, mm-hmm. where he's kind of like, not really sure what to do. There's a story about, which is, it's just like a throwaway line in one of the, the tracks. Someone stole my guitar and made it out of Tinseltown. He got like mm-hmm. completely mugged, like his whole car. Oh, yeah. His got whole car that he was like, like moving. Like all of his instruments and everything. everything yeah, like all there. of his stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's actually great. Like that is absolutely the stuff in nightmares. And it's just like yeah. a throwaway line in one of the tracks. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Also, shout, shout out to the guy 35. that tried to help him. Right. Like that's what I love. Oh, yeah. The audiobook. Like shout out to the guy that like <laughs> jump in my car, let's go and get him. And then <laughs> let's go. Get, let's go. Right. It's like, nice hey, car man, chase. we tried. You got 50 bucks. He's like, I don't. All my stuff was in the car. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, yeah. peace. But like, shout out to that guy that just saw this guy get mugged and like, we're going to track this guy down for you because that's nuts. Like, nuts. Yeah. Love it. The spirit, the spirit is with everybody, right? So yeah, part two is kind of about his whole like, he's fed up, right? He's angry. He's mm-hmm. like had enough of LA, you know, um, all the clubs there that used to pay me. Now began to say they got no time, so presumably mm-hmm. not getting as many gigs, not getting as much work. Um, and yeah, that whole section concludes with, um, yeah, it's all I can do, which is you know, kind of a mellow, softer number. And um, yeah, it's all I can do to sell my junk, pack up and leave LA. Yeah. So off he goes. He leaves off his he brother behind. He leaves yeah. Spock's that are like just, you know, just on, um, just on the light. Yeah. 1995, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And he, he walked away from it all. Right. And yeah. it's just like, whoa. Wow. to nashville of all places yeah and then we move into part three part three he moves to nashville he's off 
Not a thing. <laughs> He's in his new place. I drove out to Nashville in the pouring rain. <laughs> oh, such a like great line. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, with just my guitar, my dog, my tape machine. I thought I might have some luck out there. So proper like. I don't know how much he's elaborating, right? But that's that's proper like rock and roll musician. Like, <laughs> yeah, I took my guitar and like a little tape machine, and like off I went. It's like off I go. I guess, oh, yeah. Man. I mean, a different time, right? This was obviously after Evil Monk, so I, I I think he just got rid of all of his stuff and like just literally one car and just went. Yeah. And um, yeah, then he met some more friends and. They took him to church out there and he sort of started to, you know, started to remingle with that whole yeah. uh, whole idea, right? There's another thing that's mentioned a lot in the book that's not mentioned at all in the record, which I want to say they're called landmark courses. Was that right? Yeah. Um, um, oh, what was it? It was like these courses to try to, like, get your thinking in order and, like, try to get you to be, like, the all you can be, like... Uh, yeah. nowadays i think we would call it life coaching yeah or like, like self-help that kind of thing yeah yeah but this was like much more intense like it it's not quite the same extent that it is now where a lot of it yeah. is like just be who you are and let the universe provide it's just like no you have to go out and do it right and here's ways to break your thinking in order to get you back on track so he did a lot of that kind of thing as well mm -hmm. but um which i think gave him a bit of like drive and direction out of the uh outside of the alcoholism and drink driving yeah. and all that kind of stuff that he was up to back in the day mm -hmm. i mean he he really was you know a bit of a rap scallion he was living the rock and roll lifestyle you know what i mean like he was yeah he was oh, that's what i was gonna say from, um, the the persona yeah. that he likes to put on like i i always felt like the person that i was reading in his 20s and 30s was that rock style that a lot of the rockers were living back then but like without making it like without without having the groupies or without having that type of a, like legacy behind him and yet here he is like the thing that really caught me off guard was how much drunk driving he was doing i'm like my guy you're gonna end up dead and that's yeah, part of the thing, yeah, yeah. Like, by the grace of god i'm still alive i think this is the start of the record where he's kind of like all right i'm in Nashville, and like i'm going to the church and mm -hmm. the book's obviously super descriptive about how we kind of like eventually you know he, he he finds his wife and mm -hmm. you know starts to sort of attend more often and it eventually sort of bubbles up and surfaces into like if i if i read the book rightly like basically speaking tongues at one point like yeah. really just like yeah I think... the lord was like in him like he well, something something like clicked one day when he went to church um yeah i think him. it it wasn't when he was getting baptized because that was a little bit later on, but there was that moment yeah. where like, because up to that point, I think his girlfriend, now wife, was much more into the church and like he would drop her off, but wouldn't necessarily go in. And like, he just heard this voice calling him in and it's just like, just go, just go. Right. And he's like, well, that's not my bag. I was never into that kind of stuff. But then eventually when he did go just like this awakening happened and yeah as you say he was just starting at one point he was just like i was speaking a language i didn't understand i was speaking in tongues and i'm just like good for you man that's yeah. holy geez like ride that's, that way yeah. um yeah. and as you said sing it high sing it low sing it everywhere you go jesus mm -hmm. will deliver mm -hmm. you and suffering mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and with that we move into part four part four because there's still two more parts Sherry and I got married in my bass player's old backyard. Uh, my mom and dad tried, but they took my moving hard. The band mm -hmm. started doing better. It's box Back in 1998, I started to think that maybe it's not too late. Because I think he he, he thought at this point that he kind of just wasn't going to achieve what he wanted to achieve with his music. Um, that he would yeah. just always be gigging in cover bands and all of this kind of stuff, right? He wouldn't actually make big time and get a record deal and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, 1998, Spox was, Spox was picking, but he woke up one day and realized he wasn't sad anymore. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. sounds like moving to Nashville was a good idea, right? Yeah. Um, originally. Yeah, and I, be I believe at this point, wasn't this where he was starting to get, like, a lot more within Spox notoriety? And I think that's where Mike Portnoy, like, legit called him up after he had seen... Uh, yeah. 
you know, and I love that in the book where Neil saw an interview with Mike Portnoy and, and Portnoy spent more time talking about Spock's beard than he did of Dream Theater. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish that he had touched a little bit more about this in the album, but it was really interesting to read it in the book about part of the reason why the initial um, outreach for Mike was like, this was when Neil was praying and being like, where's the work? Where, like, how do I continue? I'm starting to think about leaving Spock's beard, but I'm not quite sure about that yet. Um, and I don't know where that money's coming in. Like, I, if I leave Spock's beard, which is my cash cow at the moment, how am I going to subsidize that? And Mike was like, hey, I'm putting together a super group with the guy from Fate's Warning, myself. We're just looking for a bass player and we're hoping that you can fill in the shoes for the keyboardist and like lyricist. Like that's what really threw me because I'm like, well, that almost sounds like transatlantic, but it was Roy Stalt. And then unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately for the history books, you know, the guy from Fate's Warning, whose name already escapes me, couldn't make it just due to scheduling. Um, so that's where they got Roland Stolt. The rest is history. I wish that there was a little bit of that in the record, but I also know that you got to cut something, right? You can't put your yeah. whole entire life in there. Yeah. I mean, I th my understanding as well is that came about about like a couple of months after he left Spock's beard as well. Like it wasn't. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Like he was in this limbo point. for like a little bit. Yeah. yeah no, no, no. But uh, yeah, he was just in like a limbo for like a while, not really sure what he was doing. And that kind of just came uh -huh. out of the blue a little bit, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Like that would have been a really good, like the Lord always provides, right? It's like the one messaging mm -hmm. from the book and the album, it's like God only illuminates the next step. He doesn't give you the floodlight for like the whole journey. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And it kind of goes on, right? You kind uh -huh. of hit that point in this record where Neil's on board. Uh -huh. I am willing, I am broken. All I want is you. Oh father, come and take me now. He is ready for something to happen, right? Something to push him over the line and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of go for that baptism, right? And uh, you know, he goes on over to feel him. And I knew it was him. I knew it was Jesus. That line always gets a big. I always sing along with that line in the car. Oh yeah. <laughs> I knew it was Jesus. <laughs> Gotta hit those high notes. <laughs> yeah. Such a like and bearing in mind how long this record is as well, it's like over two hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. like that's like almost at the end, right? And you're just like, yeah, like you're totally this... on board with the story at that point. You're like, yeah, Neil, let's yeah. go. Like, you just, just <laughs> you get that, Jesus. Let's do this. Um, yeah, and then it goes into the part five, which is the the finale, right? Especially the yeah. shortest part. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like twelve minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Rejoice. Rejoice for the king is here. Yes, he's with us now. It's in my lyrical notes. Um, Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That's the point, right? Neil has found the Lord. The Lord has found Neil. And yeah. they're connected. And, and that's kind of how it concludes, right? And it's... I think I appreciated it so much more after reading the book, mm -hmm. uh, which I picked up at, at Morse Fest London, the second one I went to. Yeah just so yeah really really interesting just mm -hmm. having a journey kind of so personal and, and sharing that with the world basically right yeah and um obviously i mentioned there's testimony too as well which um gets even more deep and personal um because mm -hmm. testimony too is kind of like right i found the lord what next yeah um yeah yeah Where's and it goes step? through you know yeah it goes through all sorts of interesting stories and journeys and there's all sorts of little melodic hooks and throwbacks related to the first record also worth listening to but um we won't won't get into that's, that's not what we're talking about but, i mean that's not what we're talking about today. yeah uh, yeah even outside of the concepts the instrumentation is incredible you know it's really cool i think mm -hmm. all the little arrangements all the little licks all the little things that he does um yep. i feel like particularly so at that point it was more original in the sense of like Neil Morse has a sound um, yes. and you will know within about a minute of listening to a record or if it starts with a song called Overture that Neil Morse probably wrote it he yep. has a lot of signature little tricks and moves and sounds and tones but obviously this is the first time he did it right on his own with no no one else telling him how to do it or you know no conceding with other band members or anything like that right he mm -hmm. he wrote it and if you have any interest in Neil Morse whether that's Box Beard stuff or whether it's the transatlantic stuff 
whether it's mm-hmm. the flying color stuff or whether it's some of his other solo stuff or yeah it's troika and all those or, yeah or troika or one of the... <laughs> <laughs> the the dude's busy the dude's busy this is definitely a record that's worth listening to to just sort of learn a little bit about him right yeah i'd, I'd really recommend it even though it is 20 over 20 years old now it is um, we just crossed the 20 year mark because this was 2023 or sorry 20 2002 i know what year that, we're in 2003 <laughs> 2003 was when it was released so yeah, yeah that yeah. was 20 years ago last year and one of the things that he mentions in the book is like you know john gives however many like eight testimonies or something like that four testimonies and part of the reason why he wrote Testimony 2 was because I need to continue this. I need to continue that. And since Testimony 2 came out in 2011, I was wondering if we're going to get a Testimony 3 in the next couple of years. Um, mm. You know, kind now of following. Like, yeah, maybe he needs to pray on I mean, that just a little bit. Um, I, mean, I think his next step with that is he's playing those he's doing the trifecta of Morse Fests again. He's doing the one in Nashville, yeah. the one at the, the border eye in the Netherlands and the one in, say in London, the one near London, all yeah. the same venues. Um, yeah. So I guess he's got those run of shows to kind of look at and yeah, I don't really know what else he gets up to these days. He's, he's a very prolific writer. He does a lot and he is kind of, yeah, similar to Mike Portnoy in the fact that it's like, Oh, what you, another one you just did another, another record one? it's like <laughs> yeah albums just sort of like fall out of his trousers you know what i mean it's just like yeah. oh there's, there's another one i guess yeah. there you go there um, you go yeah so yeah, it's like i mean it might calm down a baby baby uh, ducks right it's like just keep feeding us mother <laughs> just keep keep it coming yeah. yeah um and it might calm down a bit right now that um mike's busy with dream theater because a lot of neil's projects yeah. were tied to mike um yeah. but we, we we shall see you know it's yet to be seen it sounds like um, the morse yeah. fests are going ahead without mike pornoy eric gillette switching to drums i don't think they've announced yeah. who the guitarist is yet if there will be that, one. i yeah i haven't seen because yeah eric was just announced as drummer and i know he can do it like he's he's a fantastic drummer yeah but and yeah. it's all the joseph records that i'm pretty sure mike didn't actually drum on anyway i don't I think. believe so no he wasn't on jesus christ the exorcist as well which like was kind of the first one of the whole because in the book uh neil morris talks about how many musicals he wrote like he wrote like two or three musicals and he almost got one staged and so i think this yeah. is like from those projects and so these are kind of like those prog musical theater kind of stuff yeah but i don't think mike Portnoy was on any of those i think he was on solar gradia i think his 2020 album but um yeah I'm not so I know... familiar with the other Neil Moore solo albums not yet that's that's not... the next place I'm going I'm gonna <laughs> after this I think this is maybe the end of my journey with testimony for now because uh-huh. I have uh-huh. listened to it countless times over the past right. eight months and so I have a right. new Neil Morse album to put in the car mm-hmm. <laughs> I was gonna say I I highly recommend the one-two punch of the Neil Morse band of um the similitude of a dream and uh, the great adventure is good but similitude I've got of a dream those two is... covered. No, I've, got oh, those I've got those two, two albums I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here what am i doing innocence in danger i've got you know that one was also innocence in danger fine. i really really like um yeah yeah um yeah so we 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 have kind of taken my my outline and played a little bit around with it um the one thing I wanted to, to bring our, our chat back to is within the music, and this was something that I wanted to dive a little bit more into, specifically with this album, is like one of the things that I love about concept records is allowing the music to reinforce the story. And I feel within this boy, it works both to its advantage and also sometimes I don't quite feel it. Like on one of the first tracks where... He was talking about how low he was and how life wasn't really treating him very well and all that. It's very like up tempo. It's very happy within the music. I think like it wor- It both works and it doesn't work in that I would expect that to be very dour and very like not so great. But in practicality for an album, you want to open up with a good punch. You want to open up with a good bang. And this could also be a mirror for like the mask or the facade that he was wearing to be like, oh no, everything's fine. I love this rocker mentality where I'm getting drunk all the time and driving. Yeah, I'm wondering how do you feel like the music enhances 
the storytelling and like kind of bringing forth his own like trials and tribulations i guess mm. yeah, yeah that's interesting i think <sighs> yeah i've not really considered that the the first part is like quite jolly and like upbeat um mm. with a lot of the um the writing but then i feel like whenever the subject of jesus comes up everything just sort of like floats away and it it all sort of like tightens up and just gets into like this little intimate space and slows uh -huh. down and it's just like Neil with the guitar or with the piano and it's just like this little story and mm -hmm. then it opens up again and it goes like <laughs> what's going on what's going on what's happening do I like the, the what's going on am I a Christian am I not am I crazy am I drunk what's going on and it's like yeah. no this is who I am Mm -hmm. And I kind of, mm -hmm. I I enjoy that. I think it adds to the the dramaticism of it, um, and almost the flamboyance of of how he's telling the story at points. Like I said, I knew, and I knew it was him. I knew it was Jesus. That like moment sticks out in my mind because it's just so. Mm -hmm. There's something about the way he delivers those lines. It's like, it's slow. It's epic. It's like, no, wish you, and it's just like, <laughs> and it's suddenly yeah. like, what? We've hit this like absolute peak of a mountain um and yeah i think the word painting with that is great it's so mm -hmm. emotional i think yeah um which is almost definitely what it was going for because he is the man that cries like no one else at his own concerts oh, yeah. notoriously yeah. always crying um yeah. which i think it's so awesome it's so like good for you man like you yeah. know what i mean <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you know the move, the music is moving when the artist is crying afterwards, right? Like that's part of the reason why I love watching a lot of his Morse Fest live stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you see just how moved he is with it. I also I have two thoughts. The first one is I always find it very interesting that Neil won't allow any of the music on streaming sites, so like Spotify and all that. Like, there's none of them, but you just jump over to YouTube and they're all there. So I always found that's always very interesting <laughs> that all of his like live dvd stuff is very easily accessible on youtube the second part when we're talking about the music you can still feel like this is his first attempt at the well i guess not the first attempt the first attempt was snow um but this big narrative uh concept record because i think in the i can't remember what part it is but there's a moment that feels very tommy um and quadrophenia from the who um, mm -hmm. where you've got like the synths and the sounds and I'm like, oh, that's very like Tommy and the Who. I don't know if that's meant to be an homage or if that's meant to be like a, hey, look, we're doing a Tommy kind of an idea. Yeah, I'm sure there's, uh, little thoughts there's lots of little nods and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff to all the artists that, that he, he loves, right? I'm sure there's, there's all of that. Again, I mean, there's so much in the book about yeah certain records that he discovered like when he first listened to a Beatles record when he first listened to Genesis and yes and all this stuff it's um yeah, yeah really interesting so I'm, I'm sure there's little nods in there that uh everyone's missed probably mm -hmm. but in 20 years time someone will say oh is that, <laughs> oh, is that, yeah, that song what's that song send an email to Neil and he'll be like finally someone noticed finally somebody <laughs> noticed yeah yeah, this whole time we were waiting for like reclamation from Gentle Giant in like the third part of this. All right, uh, before we go into the final section of this, uh, which is to see whether or not this is a platinum concept album test, we've been talking how much we love this record. Are there any negatives? Are there anything within this album that either didn't work completely or maybe like the concept is too heavy handed does it does it get lost in the sauce like is there anything negative that you can think about within this album or is it just all 10 out of 10 all perfect album oh that's tricky i yeah. the thing is i think it's hard to say this is a 10 out of 10 album you know if you're comparing this to like metallica's load record it's like what um, <laughs> that's the record you go to obviously you, <laughs> yeah if, if you're trying to work out as an album if an album is incredible obviously it's got to be of a certain standard which it definitely mm -hmm. is yeah but if it's 10 out of 10 that's another question because i feel like to properly make that judgment 
I need I would have needed to have listened to a lot more of Neil solo records. And mm -hmm. the only two I really know are Testimony and Testimony 2, which I am bound to change. I know loads yeah. of his other work. I know that all the stuff with Swox Beard and Transatlantic and Neil Lambin and but his actual solo records I don't know as much. Um okay. when comparing it to some of those other records though that I'm familiar with that he's on, it is kind of one of my favorites now um oh, okay i think just because it's so personal it, it's long yes is there fat that could be trimmed maybe do i want that not really yeah i kind of i really like it as it is i think every moment has a reason for being there um unlike some prog albums where they're just sort of you're like what but you already you know, what? another bit mm -hmm. you know i think mm -hmm. it might feel like there's a lot of fluff but i don't know how it could be any shorter if that makes sense i don't know yeah yeah i think it is good and interestingly enough at morse fest halfway through the show my porno stands up you know he does his little speech yeah and um even he says that uh testimony he reckons is like the best thing nils written full stop wow. Um, yeah. which I think is an incredible, incredible compliment. Um, yeah. You know, maybe not Mike's favorite, but I think he definitely said it was the best, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And from what I know of Neil's stuff, I might have to agree with that, but mm, okay. I don't know everything. There's too much to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, let's, let's, let's put this through the test. So I've devised five basically yes or no questions. Uh, to put this album through to see what type of an album this is. If it gets zero to, out of five, then it is trash. It is a trash record. If it gets one out of five, then it's a tin. If it's a two out of five, it's a bronze. A three out of five is silver. Four out of five is gold. It's a gold record. But five out of five is a platinum. So we're going to see okay. by asking some of these questions, you know, putting some numbers to these figures, is the album a platinum record? The first one is, is the concept original? Is this concept that this album is playing with, is it an original concept? I mean, yes and no. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Because no one else has made a record about the life of Neil Morse, but other people Yet. have definitely made concept records about their own lives. Right and their their experiences and so is that in itself an original idea no really. so yeah here's how i'm equating this one because i'm thinking of other like autobiographical concept records you know i'm thinking of the wall from pink floyd which is a roger water story there have been songs that are very autobiographical and there have been records that have been like hey here are moments in my life but like I can't think of any that are like this intent on this is my testimony of how I came to God. Yeah. So in, I think in it's, that, it's unique in that aspect for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, you have the final say. My guest always has the final say. In that case, I would say that it's an original concept because um, nobody had done it to this extent before. Yeah. I I think I would agree with that. I think it's a bit of, but yeah, I think I would, I would lean towards saying it's a, it's pretty original. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's one. So we have moved it away from trash. It is not trash. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, does the music reinforce the themes of the concept? Yeah. Yeah. That's, an easy so. one. that's pretty easy. That's pretty easy. Oh. Yeah. When, when he's talking about it being sad, it's sad. When he's talking about it being, oh my gosh, I'm seeing the light of God, it's doing that as well. And even those moments that we had mentioned at the beginning where, you know, his life is not great, um, we can still at least understand why the music is the way that it is. So, yeah, I would say that that's yeah. a yeah. Yeah, for sure. And also the bits that's... where he's like confused at what's going on is also like just crazy weird noodly bits in the music as well. So, yeah, there's a... <laughs> It's a bit yeah. of everything for every every moment. <laughs> yeah, as my partner would say, it's when prog music goes doo 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 doo. I'm like, yeah, that's oh, that's yeah, right. no, it does do that quite largely. That's yeah, it does. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm always like, so what was your favorite part of that song? She's like, oh, when the guitarist did doodly 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 doodly. I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 that's, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. All right, so this is where they start to get a little bit more uh, tricky and a little bit more um, harder to answer. Uh, oh, the third one is, okay, let's go. Uh, the third question is, is it accessible to the casual listener? Can somebody sit down and listen to it? Like somebody off the street, somebody that has never listened to Neil Morris record before. Probably not. Yeah. I think for you to appreciate this record, you have to have an existing vested interest. Yeah. I don't think it will land if you don't. I I unfortunately agree, and I think also part of that is just the the length as well. I think yeah, it's over two hours over two hours is a lot to ask. There, that's a lot of buy in that I don't think just anybody off the street can have. And if you don't have that kind of vested interest, like outside, like I know I keep leaning on Tommy and and the Wall, but like Tommy has Pinball Wizard, the Wall has Comfortably Numb you know, that has these big radio accessible things that everybody knows and loves. This boy doesn't really have those to lean on. So there's not a hanging... single anywhere no. to be found. In this no. So in um, that case, I, I can't give it to this one. But yeah. I don't think that's a flaw. I think that's a feature that I really enjoy about this album. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. So unfortunately, that is that is one one miss. The next one is: is the music solid from start to finish? Are there any dips in qualities or any songs that are dubs? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think after spending so much time with the record, I kind of appreciate every bit for for me mm -hmm. personally. But if you're giving it more of a casual list than like maybe once or twice, I feel like it's very easy to look at parts of it and just go, oh, well, he's done like four songs where he says God is great. How many times do you four need to songs? say it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd argue they're all very necessary, but to a more like not, I don't want to say super fan of these records, but like to someone that's <laughs> like more ambivalent towards them, Mm -hmm. I think it's you'd probably say there's yeah not really yeah now here's and I think we're going to get to this in the next question but in terms of quality I don't think that there's any dips like there wouldn't be any tracks on here that I would skip um even though and that is something huge when you're dealing with an album that's over two hours long I think what makes it hard as well is that every track is like seamless transition into the next one right mm -hmm. so you, there's not really an opportunity to skip anything because it's all just one big almost symphony of music right yeah. yeah could you imagine trying to listen to this guy on shuffle like <laughs> i kind of want to try that now <laughs> yeah i'm saying that uh, i can't do that in my car because it's across two different discs that is true yeah <laughs> Yeah, like I remember my six CD changer that we had in the living room growing up, and you can put all the CDs in there on shuffle, and it would legit just change songs across oh, wow. the different. Yeah, it was really intense. We inherited it from like this super rich neighbor that was having their like estate sale, and my dad's like, "I'll take this for five hundred dollars." Yes, you. Thank you very much. Um, and this was like you know mid nineties. All right, so do we think? Um, the music is solid from start to finish. Yeah. I would I would also agree. I think I think it is from start to finish. Um, so that's three, three for four. Coming into the last question. Is the album the perfect length? Is it too long or too short? Too short. <laughs> we uh, wanted four hours. Well, that's why we got testimony too, so we can have the uh, full album that's like, you know, four hours long. Not and that's why there are the, the bonus tracks as well. There are. Have you listened to the bonus tracks? Those things are like the first one is weird. I'm like, oh, that did not age well. That is. Oh, the Fang Sings. The Fang Sings. I'm like, yeah, oh, that's bye. a bit of a throwaway. <laughs> oh, no. But it gets bye. better after that. There's... It does. The second track is really good. Is the second one supernatural or is that the third one? 
Uh, on on waterfall, there's only the two. Um, let me just see. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether supernatural is from testimony one or testimony two. It would be testimony two because the okay. two songs are Fang sings and then Tuesday afternoon find my dot 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 find find my way back home. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so is it too this long? Is one of those questions. It's, it's or is subjective. It, it is subjective. It's, it's very subjective. This <laughs> I I personally would say it's not too long. However. I I know very few people that would agree with me that aren't Neil Moore super fans. I have a lot of friends that love Prog. And if I said, hey, you like Prog, yeah? You like concept albums, yeah? You like it when there's like a long song and it's like really cool and it like goes all sorts of different places, yeah, yeah. Do you want to listen to this record that's two and a half hours long? That's all about finding Jesus? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I know so many Prog fans that like modern day punk fans that will not listen to an album that's longer than an hour. And um, yeah. yeah, I think if I try and be a bit more objective, maybe the record is too long um, yeah. to the everyday person. However, if you love Neil Morse, you want more. You always want more. Yeah. And that's why Testimony yeah. 2 is there. And that's why in my car, Testimony 1, Testimony 2. Yeah go straight through and then the testimony two bonus tracks because that bonus tracks for testimony two so good really oh, good okay i'm gonna have to dive in yeah because isn't the second i have both transatlantics where they were touring the whirlwind and the world tour and i think the less the second one is like gluttons for punishment or more is not enough or something like that it's mm -hmm. like yeah we want we want more we always want more um and i don't i don't know like on the one hand and I think that was part of the reason why it kept me away from this record was the length of like, oh, it's yeah. two hours, man. Ah, I don't know, man. That's... For what it's worth, I, if they weren't doing this for Morsefest, um, which is the only reason I first picked up this record, um, if they weren't doing it for that, the likelihood of me picking this up is pretty slim. Um, mm -hmm. However, now that I have... I'm way more inclined to listen to other longer works from from Neil. So yeah, it, it's yeah, maybe, and, maybe it's fine. Yeah, I'm I'm in I'm in the camp that I think it's okay um, because it works with the album. You're following this guy's journey, and you want to get the full the full length of it. Um, I don't think it's his worst long record because I've listened to a number of his other like double disc concept records um that i'm like come on guy you you could cut so much um whereas i don't think that this has that same quality i think i think the runtime is justified so i am okay giving it the pass for this one if you are as well yeah i think so and with that we have determined that this record is a gold standard record it's a gold Whoa. record he he reached gold so that's four four out of five um and the the final question that we will end this on is would you consider this album a masterpiece i know we had a little bit of a conversation leading up to this but would you would you put this on the high shelf with metallica's load well obviously metallica's load will go one shelf higher uh, right than of everything. course you got the Just everything. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, come on, be silly. Come on, what are we um, talking about? I mean, for me, it would be Lulu. Lulu would be right up there. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's just me though. No, that, that has a separate room. <laughs> that's a, it has a room all to itself. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a different different, different conversation. Um, Absolutely. One hundred percent. This is Neil's masterpiece. Mm -hmm. I don't think he can ever recreate the magic of this. For how personal. The record was to him mm -hmm. i think he'll make other music that's great and really good and you know maybe the instrumentals are, be are better and surpass it but the, the the story the concept the lyrical content i i don't think neil can beat i don't think it's possible mm -hmm. i don't think anything more dramatic could ever happen i think yes. it's neil's masterpiece that's fair yeah my i i would agree to all that the only thing i would caveat is that 
in the end, I wish that there was his big crescendo that we always get, like that big, like stranger in your soul, uh, wind at your back, like big triumph track. But I also know that this is like part one, right? And I haven't sat down and listened to Testimony 2 in a hot minute. So I don't know if that has it. Um, but I would agree that this is his magnum opus. Like this is his journey. And even though yeah. he has written better stuff since then, like Similitude of a Dream, um, Sola Scriptura. Um, yeah. I, I, mean, I, still, yeah, I don't doubt that there's other stuff that's, that's better. In, but I don't think... Yeah, but I think like for him, this is his big statement because um, that's what, what it was for, you know? Yeah. So that brings us to the end. Thank you, Grace, for coming along and chatting, that's talking great. about Neil Morse. Always a pleasure having you back someone's, on here. Someone's got to do it, you know? Somebody's got to do it. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Um yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to leave the watchers with? Anything you want to let them know about? Oh, uh, uh, listen to Testimony too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you, well, if you're not listen to one and then then listen to two. Yeah. Um, good question. I don't know. I'm in I'm in places. I write for Prog Magazine every now and then. I run my own cycle podcast where I write about proggy things every now and then. Although I'm now very busy with this um a recording studio which i've just taken over with um my business partner in london so that's busy i also have my own music that i'm working on and i'm actually doing a gig very soon or maybe already um who knows i don't <laughs> so yeah, lots of things it's it's tough to i don't know what i do anymore there's too many things just yeah. find one of them and latch on please that'd be great <laughs> and I'm so, so glad that you were able to take some time and chat with, with your old pal. So oh, thanks yeah. so much. And thanks Absolutely. to everybody for tuning in. Follow Grace on all of her adventures. Follow me on all of mine. Uh, and until next time, ooh, I need a good catchphrase for this. How should I end these? Because this is different than my usual reviews and whatnot. This is its own separate things. Oh, yeah. What should I, what should I, like the show is called What a Concept. So what should, um... What an ending? I don't know. That doesn't sound right. Was that that was a concept? That was a concept. Yeah, this this was a good idea, right? I think that. Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> yeah. workshop it. Workshop it. We'll workshop it. Yeah, in like five episodes, I'll get it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Until then, bye.